so now I'd like to introduce Kim Bailey, one of our naturalists. He's going to share her love and enthusiasm. Hi, guys. Oops. Hi, I'm Kim Bailey, and I am so excited you, enjoy, you joined us for this insect program today. If you answer that they do scare you, then I'm hoping by the end of this presentation, you are going to be so fascinated, you'll change your mind. Um, but I wanted to um, just begin a little bit with a story about why I fell in love with insects. I, um, I was, found this book recently, and um, I wanted to share that with you. It's called Insects Are My Life. And it's about a little girl that loves insects. When I saw this book, I thought, this is me. And um, like Amanda, the main character, I want to release all the, butter, all the lightning bugs. And I like to save insects, particularly the ants in my kitchen. I have been known to try everything under the sun to do anything but squash them. But unlike Amanda, I was an adult when I fell in love with insects. Um, my mentor at Vanderbilt invited me to sit in on his arthropod class. And arthropods are, include spiders and millipedes and insects, all the little critters that have jointed legs. And so I did, and when I took that class, I suddenly was just enraptured. And I decided I needed to get back into biology. I'd been raising kids. And um, so I started volunteering at the Nature Center. And so literally insects changed my life because within a month of volunteering, I was hired. And I've now been here 24 years. Um, and I've had so many opportunities to learn more about insects. So we're gonna be looking today at how insects solve the challenge of survival. They have lots of challenges, just like we do. And um, so we'll be looking at body parts and behaviors and some of the problems they have to solve. But first, let's just get started with some diversity because insects make up 80% of all organisms on our planet. And they, are, they come in a wide range of colors and shapes. Some have scales, they have hairs. They have different wing shapes and mouth parts, and they're beautiful, many of them. Some are scary, but helpful. And this guy um, lives most of his life in the water and then comes out to mate as an adult, lives just a short time. You can go to pretty much any flower and find insects right now. September, it turns out, is the time to go see insects. Um, they are covering our fields and meadows, and you can even walk around your house and look for insects. They're on your walls, they're trapped in spider webs, it's, uh, they're available. I love this beetle, he's got so many cute features. So just to get us started, I, wanted to, um, I do wanna engage you during this, um, and so we're gonna ask you a couple of questions, and, um, and Rachel's gonna start a poll. All right, so I'm going to launch a poll. It should pop up on your screen, and it is which group of insects has the most species. So you get to decide which one do you think has the most species. Is it beetles, butterflies and moths, bees, wasps and ants, or flies? I'm going to give everybody a second to vote, and it's okay if you get the wrong answer. It's not a problem. <laughs> Let me give everybody a chance. All right, looks like everybody has voted, so I will share those results. Awesome. And it looks like 67% say beetles. Yeah, so I'm going to let. All right, so we will. Good job, guys. The answer is beetles. So beetles far outweigh all other insects in numbers of species. And of course, it's different kinds within that group. And flies are a good second choice for that. Um, Compare that to 8,000 mammal species known right now. So obviously insects and beetles in particular make up huge numbers of the organisms in our, our country or in the world. So let's start with beetles. Many beetles don't even have the name beetle in there. This is a ladybug. And you know it's a beetle because it has those hardened, colorful wings. That they're not always colorful, but they're hard wings that cover the inner membranous wings. And ladybugs are also called ladybird beetles. And then lightning bugs are also called fireflies. There's no beetle in their name, but they are beetles. Weevils are really cool insects and they are beetles too. You might not know it at first glance, but look at those wings, hard covering the, the membranous ones. I wanted to point out this cool um, extended mouth part. It, they are pests usually, they get into our seeds and grains and crops and they feed at the very end with these little mouth parts at the end. 
and their antennae are even attached to the mouth part. So that's very unusual. And mouth parts kind of introduces us to our first big challenge. What am I going to eat and how am I going to eat it? And so we have lots of different types of mouth parts. What do you notice about this mouth part? Put that in the chat. And if you want to guess what it might eat, go ahead and put that in there too. Yeah, if you guys saw it on there, Ken, you might want to run your cursor over the mouth part again on the picture. And uh, what do you notice? If you want to add in the chat what that reminds you of, or what you think that mouth part might eat. And I'm happy to read off people's suggestions about that mouth part. To me, it looks very wide and flat. Somebody's wondering if it's a proboscis. Excellent. So I know you guys can't, but you can't really talk. So even if you raise your hand, I can't really have you talk. So you can just put it into the chat. Or if you um, have a question, you can, uh, or having some technical difficulties, remember to call that phone number. Somebody wants to know what a proboscis is. So we're already having a discussion about that. Someone's wondering if that eats uh, nectar using that mouth part. Okay, let's find out. The next slide will let you know what it eats. <laughs> this is a wheel bug. It's the largest member of the assassin bug family here in Tennessee. And you can see he's got his beak, this is called a beak, into the abdomen of a little butterfly that probably came to get some nectar and instead became lunch to this wheel bug. So um, he has a tube-like, think of it as a hollow toothpick. It's sharp at the end, it can pierce, but then he can suck up the juices of whatever prey he's caught. So want many, many insects eat other insects. Here's another one, this is called a robber fly. And robber flies have almost needle-like mouth parts that stab and suck. And this was an unfortunate bee that got caught. We all know praying manids and how they have those cool front legs that they hold up like this and they're very, very still. And um, when something flies by, they reach out and grab it. And then they have chewing mouth parts. So it's dangerous to be an insect at any time of life. Here's two eggs that, were that um, I found in my yard and I was so excited every day I checked them in the morning. And they actually turned to a beautiful red color at some point. And one, after they turned red, I thought, oh, they must be ready to hatch. And the next morning I went out with anticipation and this is what I found. And I thought, oh, maybe there's larvae. So I started looking hopefully for caterpillars. I wasn't sure. Looked all around, couldn't find anything. But when I lifted this leaf, I found, it, found this. And this is an assassin bug nymph when they're young. And it's pretty clear that this guy who also has that beak came and ate the insides of this egg. So um, lots of dangers if you're an insect. This is a, um, called a scorpion fly because some of the males will curl their abdomen like a scorpion. They do not sting though. Their mouth part also is kind of elongated and they are actually scavengers. They're kind of the vultures of the insect world. They will go feed on um, dead animals and sometimes they even, I mean, sorry, dead insects. Sometimes they even steal prey from spider webs, which makes it pretty brave in my book. Let's watch this. Look at this little teeny ant pulling this dead giant ant. And one of the, the tools that they have, if you're an ant, is you have really strong jaws that can clasp and pull and superhuman strength. The, the amount of weight they can carry compared to their body weight is, is amazing. So lots of cool characteristics there. This is, see that little white thing moving around? Here's another dead insect and this is a beetle larva that specializes on eating dead things. So, um, Great out in nature, if you have a bug collection, you don't want these beetles anywhere nearby. So let's, now let's turn to some more gentle feeding. And this is the cicada. And he's actually not going to eat this caladium. He's going to go and find um, a tree and they will put their beak. It's the same kind of mouth part, but they suck juices. So he sucks tree sap. Aphids, I know you all have aphids in your yard, and aphids suck um, the plant sap. 
and they're very sweet. The sap that comes out. See this ant right here? I wonder what it's doing. I'm going to show you a video of another group of insects called tree hoppers and um, let you see ants around them. And I want you to put in the chat your guess as to what's going on here. Anybody have any ideas? Yeah, we have two that are uh, suggesting that they're farming aphids. <laughs> you guys stole my line. Yes, they are farming essentially, or you could think of it as tending their sheep. Basically, tree huggers are related to aphids. They're feeding on sap. And um, if you eat sugar water all day long, guess what you're gonna poop out? Sugar water. It's called honeydew. And so ants have developed this relationship where they tend, they actually, you'll see them stroking to get the, the honeydew to be released. And then in exchange, they provide protection from predators. And these tree hoppers have been, they have done, um, used some kind of special microphone that's a sound we can't hear, it's so low but they emit sounds when they, um, a predator's nearby. So the, the ants protect and then the tree hoppers provide sugar. And the same thing happens with the aphids. So good job, lots of things you can eat. Now we get to our proboscis and we can define that. A proboscis is a mouth part that acts like a straw and butterflies have um, proboscis, so do um, moths. And, and we'll find out later someone else does. So here's some pictures of them using this cool straw. Of course, when they're feeding, uh, when they're not feeding, they will roll this up in below their chin. Can you imagine if you could carry a straw with you like that? Ready to go. They also use their proboscis for um, minerals from mud. And then this little guy, it's not a great video, but he's actually getting minerals from um, bird poop. And of course, some of them um, will get land on you and get salt from your skin. So have any of you guys had this happen to you? Please put in the chat. Any, during this program, I'd love to hear your stories of encounters with insects if you've got something you wanna share. But um, maybe, I don't know if you can just put a hands up if you've had this happen or put it in the chat. Yes, we're getting some hands up for that. If they've ever had a butterfly on your skin, it kind of tickles when they're sucking the, or licking up the, the salt. So yes, several people had their hands raised. They have had this happen before. Oh, well, somebody said no, but I wish I had. <laughs> well, come to the Nature Center because this is a hackberry emperor. They are considered the friendliest butterfly in town and we have them all around the campus. So go take a run, get sweaty, and come over and hang out, and you'll probably get a chance to, to experience that. Now let's move on to grasshoppers. We know that they love to eat plants, and they have these little chewing mouth parts, and it's sort of like carrying a knife and fork around with them. They can slice and eat and chew um, plants. Here's a cool video of a caterpillar I found that is chewing on an oak leaf. And I actually found this on the sidewalk. And I wanna do a plug for iNaturalist, um, which is a free app, because I used iNaturalist to identify my caterpillar, and then I looked up what its host plant was. It turns out caterpillars only can feed on certain plants. They are literally evolved with the plant. If the plant has any kind of toxins or chemicals in it, they've evolved um, a way to eat through and to, to digest those. And so if I put this caterpillar on a dandelion, it couldn't eat it and it would eventually starve. So it's really important to know when you move a caterpillar where to put it. But they have chewing mouth parts like this wasp. And wasps, um, well, you'll often see them gnawing on porches and um, piece of stumps or things like that. And they're actually gathering wood to make their nest as well as feeding with them. Bees are the coolest because they're not happy with just one mouth part, they have two. So they have these mandibles right here that are amazing. They start off life by chewing their way out of their cell with them. They feed um, other 
like bee larvae with them. They have grooves in them where they can put the food and kind of serve it. They um, mold wax with it, so they're very useful throughout their life. And then they also have a proboscis. So see this tongue, which is essentially a tongue or straw-like part that they use to get into the nectar. I love this video. You can actually see this one getting water or dew from a leaf. And they do use water when they make wax. I had never seen this in all my life. So when I saw this, I was always have your, your camera with you, at least your iPhone or whatever phone you have, because you never know when you're going to encounter a cool insect like this. Sometimes bees cheat. Like, for example, this flower is, might be hard for that bee's mouth part to get into. It's pretty long. And so they just go to the back and they use those mandibles. They cut into the back and then they lap up the nectar. So they're very intelligent. They also need pollen. Pollen provides protein for the hive. And so this, this one has been visiting um, flowers and you can see it trying to get it off its front legs. This bee was hysterical to watch. He was literally doing flips and rolling in the nectar uh, and, and pollen. His tongue, I wish I had a video of it, but his tongue kept sticking out and um, grabbing nectar while it was rolling in the pollen. And do you see this cool structure right here? That is called a pollen basket. And it's stiff hairs on the back legs that when it's moving around, it gathers the pollen and forms these balls and makes it easy for them to carry it back to that hive. All right, here's an interesting food source, dung. So these dung beetles are rolling, they, one of them went and found some scat, rolled this little ball out of it and is carrying it off to provide food for its eggs. So when the eggs hatch, the larva can, can feed on the dung. But there's all these rogue dung beetles out there who actually will come and intercept someone who's rolling a ball and it saves all the energy of finding the scat and rolling it and he's trying to take it away from the other <laughs> dung beetle. So here they are in combat for this little ball of scat. Dung beetles are fascinating in a lot of other ways. That you'll have to um, text me more if you want to know about how the Milky Way helps them. All right, we have some other body parts that are um, intriguing. So this uh, is an ovipositor. A female wasp that has this long ovipositor, which means egg layer, and they use these to, to lay their eggs in various places. Some of them lay eggs beneath tree bark. It's hard to imagine that this could pierce tree bark, but it does, and then when their eggs um, hatch, they feed on the larva of insects that are um, inside the tree. Or some of them lay eggs inside poor caterpillars that um, can't really defend themselves. And when the eggs hatch, they feed on the, the caterpillar and they come out. And these are, these are the little cocoons of the wasp on the outside of the caterpillar. So lots of dangers if you're a butterfly or any other insect. This one was lucky it had big wings. It was able to get away with just the loss of part of its wing. My sister Ann sent me this from Maryland. She found this crab spider that grabbed a, uh, a skipper, which is a type of butterfly. So even though that's where they need to go for food, there's always pot the potential for danger to be lurking at their food source. Here's an, uh, so let's talk about some ways they try to protect themselves. This, um, this cool little bug is called a spittle bug, and it is hiding in spit, basically. It blows these bubbles and it hides inside. For some reason, this one is outside. You can kind of see it, but it's normally in the middle of that bubble pack, and that um, birds fly by and don't even recognize it as a, a possible insect, so it hides inside there. All right, let's look at this picture. Do you, can you, what do you see? Do you see an insect in here? Let's look closer. In the, in the chat, would you put what this reminds you of? What, if you just glance at this, what would you think of? Oh, someone said do. I think D-O-O. -O. So I think she might mean like bird poop. Yeah, we got a bird poop comment. <laughs> bird poop, yep, yeah, more poop. <laughs> hey, you got it, guys. So we call this the bird poop caterpillar because it does look just like a bird poop. 
And um, we, this was out in our yard of the nature center for a week and a half. And every day we would went and would, would go out and would have to spend about five minutes finding it because it kept moving and would say, oh, it's gone. And then someone finally said, no, there it is, there it is. <laughs> but what's crazy is they always leave um, the tree where they've been feeding to pupate. So we have never found a pupa. We always go out one day and they're gone. So they must move at night. Okay, camouflage, of course, is a hugely important way to protect yourself. So this beetle, notice even the grooves on the beetle seem to match the veins of the leaf here. That's a beautiful job of camouflage. Butterflies um, can land on, on leaves that look like them when they're resting and have the same effect. Now, if you walked up to this tree and I didn't have this as a close-up, you easily could miss this moth. I've even seen a moth land before, grabbed my camera and spent a while looking for it to take its picture because they blend in so perfectly. And this little guy looks like a thorn when it's on a branch. This, this is the coolest moth. I was at a friend's house and I looked outside the, uh, on the wall of the outside of the house and it had rolled its wings to completely cover its head and abdomen. So it looks like a tube. I spent some time like trying to figure out which end was the head and it's the lower end and where the abdomen was and, you know, finally made out these little legs that were barely visible. So some really cool examples. Lots of butterflies try to look like a leaf when they're closed. This one does a great job of that. But if you get too close, they'll flash these colors. So I'm gonna show you a few insects, and I want you to notice the coloration. These guys are all using red and black, some use orange and black, to, to basically say, warning, warning, don't eat me. I have toxins, I am dangerous, I am bad to eat. And some of them really do have toxins, and some of them just mimic those that do. And so it's a great, especially if you don't have to make the toxin, it turns out it costs energy, you have to eat a lot to make toxin. So if you're just pretending to have it, then you're really getting off scot-free. This guy right here, the sh everything about it, the color, the shape, warns humans, oh my gosh, don't touch that. And I'm, I've seen um, hummingbirds avoid these guys too. And then some insects will flash eye spots. It's, it's like basically saying, look, I'm way bigger than you think I am. And it also, notice the eye spots are usually down low. So here are the real eyes and here are the eye spots. And let's watch this hair streak. And they're named because they have these little projections or filaments off the back, little hairs. Watch, watch what he does, he or she does with those. So they will spend, when they're resting, they do this almost constantly. And basically, if a predator sees that, they are gonna think that these little hairs are antenna, and um, they will, it looks like it's moving and eating, and so they'll attack that end, and then the, the um, caterpillar, I mean the butterfly can escape. So that's a really cool behavioral adaptation along with physical attributes. Okay, chat time again. What do you notice? What are some things about this, this caterpillar? And tell me uh, if there's any, if you would pick this one up in the chat, please. Okay, so what do you notice about it? And would you pick this caterpillar up if you found it on the ground? So just put some, your response in the chat for us. So we've got a no, but he's cute. I agree. I would not touch it because it's got spikes. Another one says spikes, so definitely not picking that one up. It looks Good dangerous. <laughs> it is dangerous. This one will sting. A friend of mine actually um, posted this on Facebook. And every, I was shocked. Everybody was saying, ooh, it's ugly. Kill it. I mean, there are all these comments, which always surprises me that people have that reaction. This one is warning us, don't pick me up. It had those little hairs, thorny hairs that are on these projections um, do sting if you handle it. And so some caterpillars are, are really good at warning us. The colors do that too. Think about this though. Caterpillars are the best source of food for birds. 
they are out there looking, so many warblers and other insect and other birds are out looking for caterpillars right now because they are the perfect soft packet of protein. Now, of course, this guy's not so soft, so they're gonna avoid him. And this one looks like it has armor. And this one has these huge bright orange and black thorns that warn you away from it. This one um, also has just anytime I see something this hairy and all these projections, I don't pick it up. And it turns out, yes, they do have some toxins that will irritate your skin. Okay, what, just, you don't have to put this in the chat, but think real quick, what does this remind you of? Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> yes, somebody agreed, Darth Vader. Perfect. <laughs> so um, I was, this was not from Tennessee, but I was somewhere with a group of people and I heard a bunch of people screaming at the top of their lungs they were in like a stairwell and I heard, kill it, kill it. And of course I ran because I don't like to kill stuff. And I ran to see what was going on. And they were looking at this thing and they were literally all terrified. <laughs> and all it's done, it's got these odd little um, eye spots on it. And the way it holds its abdomen forward, it makes it look scary like, a, like Darth Vader. And um, it apparently works really well. The end note is that How I did love it. It was probably, oh, I don't know if y'all can see this. It was big. It was about like that. And um, so larger than a quarter, maybe 50 cent piece size. But um, I did protect it. I did save it by telling them, guys, it's a moth. So um, usually you're not afraid of a moth. Some other cool body structures <laughs> include big, thick legs. And um, th these are on a giant water bug that it uses for catching prey in the water. And also look at its camouflage. It gets down in the silt, it's already the same color and it's really hard to see. It also notice this little ovipositor sticking out of this one. Grasshoppers, their legs are vital for them. They use those to hop away. They can be a yard away in an instant, as you know, if you've ever tried to get a picture of a grasshopper and you disturb it. And this is also a female. You can see her ovipositor. Look at this um, incredible dragonfly. It has this, I mean, I wonder what it weighs compared to its legs, but those legs are so strong. They can, they, you know, basically when they perch, they have to hold this entire body up and um, they are able to do that. And of course they hold the prey too as they feed on it. Antenna are really important and they come in all different shapes and sizes. They pick up taste and smell and vibration, depending on the insect. These are long horn beetles, named after their long antenna. Look at this cool beetle. He actually opens these combs when he's using it, and when he's not, he closes them up. And then this moth, we know this is a male because he has feathery antenna, and feathery antenna are used to pick up the scent or the pheromone of the female. And so females can be a mile away and they're putting out pheromones and the male detects those with the antenna and is able to find her. And I just had to put this in there because they're such beautiful antenna. This is that hair streak again. Now let's talk about eyes. If you are a predator, you need to have good vision. And so this wasp, I swear is looking at me. <laughs> I love this picture. I feel like I'm talking to an alien, but Big, huge eyes on a wasp. And of course, dragonflies have tremendous eyes. They're hunting by on the wing over ponds usually, but also in the woods, and they need great vision to find their prey. And this is another fly that has big eyes. Here's another one, a hover fly. So all of these need these big eyes to find prey. Now let's talk about wings. Sometimes wings are, uh, if you're not a predator, you don't really need really strong wings. This moth is a night flyer and spends a lot of time at light, so it doesn't really need to fly well. But look at the, if you can see how, you can almost imagine how um, hard these wings are. If you kind of go like this with them, you're not going to tear it easily. They have lots of um, infrastructure that, that 
connects the wings and then the material is actually thicker. So these wings are important as it flies as well. This is a cool moth that um, hovers like a hummingbird at night and feeds on flowers. And it's got this aerodynamic shape and also they're very strong for hovering. And then I just put this in because this little guy was right in front of me and I was able to focus on those wings shimmering in the sun as he hovered, thus the name hoverfly. This is a cool crane fly that people think are of as mosquitoes for some reason. They are not mosquitoes, they can't bite, they don't, sometimes they eat nectar, but a lot of times they don't even feed as adults. Notice his green eyes too, that's pretty cool. I love this moth because he's just flashing all his parts. He's got his proboscis out, his antenna showing, his wings spread out. Um, so he's, a, he's having fun on my skin. Okay, another question for you. We're gonna move into why it's important to reproduce or how they, how they gain a mate. So what do you notice about this Dobson fly? You may not have ever heard of a Dobson fly. And what body so part might you? The chat. Sorry. <laughs> so pop into the chat uh, what you might notice about the body parts of this really cool insect and I can read off some of the responses. I'll give you guys a second to do that. Can maybe point a few things out with your pointer? Because it's kind of hard to see all of the parts. Sorry, I was muted. So long antenna and these big, beautiful, strong wings, and then these very interesting mandibles. Hmm, which one might yeah, somebody was wondering what this. Yeah, sorry, somebody was wondering what. Okay, so those are, that is the answer, the mandibles. So remember the mandibles of the bee that were down there for cutting and things. This is a male Dobson fly and they are just like deer. They grow these huge, like, like stags that have big antlers, they grow huge mandibles that are only used for fighting with other males for females. So oddly enough, this guy can't bite because his mandibles are too long and unwieldy. And so he doesn't bite, but he uses those to fight with males and also to look impressive to the females. Some of the beetles do that as well, like this Hercules beetle. They have been seen tussling two males, tussling over a female, and sometimes it does in an injury, like if they throw each other off a tree or whatever, but um, only used for finding a mate, improving yourself. Here's another one that has, the female would not have these enlarged mandibles. Then some insects use sound, and so I videotaped this, drag, uh, this um, grasshopper in slow motion, we're gonna, I hope you can hear it. If not, just look at the vibration of the wing as it makes it sound. So it's literally rubbing two wings together and making that sound. And this sound only its species makes. And it, the males attract the females, hopefully with their song. Pretty cool to see that slow motion, the way it was going like this. I've, I've never seen that before. So get out there with your cameras and practice them for slow motion. And then some dance for their mate. This is a peacock fly. And I love the way he's pulled his wings out and he's like turned them and he's just dancing for uh, hopefully a female. I have discovered these all over my yard. There was one in my car the other day. So I had not noticed them until a few years ago. Maybe you've got them too. Super cute. So if you're successful, you attract a mate. And of course, mating is important because you have to leave eggs and um, continue the future of your species. So I wanted to end with just some fun little findings um, that I've had just going out and looking for insects. Once um, We were actually preparing for a program one day and we found this little cluster of eggs and 
isn't it beautiful? I mean, I had no idea, no clue what it was. And so I kept going back. And then one day, these little assassin bug nymphs came out of the eggs. And then a few days later, they had turned this color. So see, they're not adults yet. They are in their nymph stage and they'll probably change their color and start growing their wings over three or four more molts after these. But that was super cool to discover what was gonna come out of these eggs. And then we were walking down the meadow and we found this exoskeleton and looked below and we found this grasshopper who had just emerged um, from its skin and was kind of, it still had to dry its wings. And um, you can see, usually you don't see the wings of a grasshopper unless they're flying real quickly, but you can see these are a little wrinkled and she's pumping fluid through them to get them ready. But I love this picture. It reminded me of someone from Avatar, <laughs> a character. There's a, there's a gentleness about her. And I think it's a her, it could, could be a male. And then one day I noticed leaves had fallen, hackberry leaves had fallen on my driveway. And with a little closer look, these little white things started moving. These are called woolly hackberry aphids. And they definitely have this little fluffy stuff that cover them and probably help protect them, camouflage them. So there's so many discoveries to find. Sometimes you find insects that look really different, like this mayfly. And I, I just want to nominate this wasp to be a superhero for the insect world because doesn't it look sort of like a Superman type character ready to combat evil? <laughs> I love this one. Impressive. Insects are great to share. And so my sister Pam from Maryland sends me pictures of the bees that sleep in her flowers at night. And she loves to tell me that at dusk she goes out to check her asters. And sure enough, she sent me like seven pictures of bees tucked in for the night. What a great thing to do if you're a bee, just fall asleep in your food source. And so when you wake up in the morning, you're ready to go. So guys, I wanna encourage you to get out there and get excited about insects. I mentioned iNaturalist.org. So here is, it's a free app, like I said, so just download it to your phone. You can also use it on your computer and use a real camera instead of your phone if you, if you wanna transfer that way. And then these are some ideas for how to discover insects, what you should take. Number one thing is observant eyes. Get out there and pay attention. And um, a magnifying glass is a great help when you see something. And then your phone with the iNaturalist app ready to go. This field guide that I've got um, in the slide, Kaufman's Field Guide, The Insects of North America, hands down the best insect guidebook for us. So I recommend that. And then um, a journal and pencils are always fun. If you wanna go out and journal insects, you always learn more if you spend time sketching them. And then optional would be a good camera. Binoculars can be really handy. Um, you might want a container. And then you'll see that cool insect gear is always fun, like this fun hat that I always get comments on when I wear. E.O. Wilson, who's a famous Harvard biologist who worked with ants um, many years, said, if we were to wipe out insects alone on this planet, the rest of life and humanity with it would mostly disappear from the land within a few months. So um, insects are so important. Like I said, 80% of known organisms on our planet, we need to protect them. So um, I've got some ideas on how to protect them, but I'd like to hear how you can celebrate and protect insects. Please put those in the chat. Pollinator gardens are definitely a great way. And I am, I do have a question if we can put resources in the chat. I'm going to do that here in just a second. Don't use pesticides. Oh, we had just have a comment. I assumed a bee would prefer to sleep in their hive versus in a flower. So they found that very interesting. Planting more flowers for them would be a great way to celebrate and protect insects. Awesome. So also, let me read my list and see if you've gotten them all. One of them is um, buying organic. Organic food and um, clothing means that they're not using herbicides, pesticides, insecticides. And 
One of the um, resources I'm going to share with you are two organizations working to conserve invertebrates. One is called the Xerces Organization, um, and the other one is um, Pesticide Action Network, and they're working to, to stop pesticides. And also creating friendly habitat can also happen if you have an apartment, any little patio that, or a front door that you can put a pot of flowers. Adding water to your yard is very insect friendly, but just a little um, like a bird bath or something even smaller so that they can get water. Um, but I think planting native plants is huge. And one of the resources I'm sharing with you is Doug Tallamy's latest webinar that um, is really fantastic. I'm hoping, I'm gonna get my family to watch it with me because it's so, um, it's so informative about how plants and, and flowers and trees have evolved together and why it's so important to plant native. So there's lots of things you can do, guys. I hope you're gonna go away from this excited about insects. There are so many interesting stories. They have come up with all sorts of strategies for survival, and I think they're more interesting than any soap opera you could imagine. So um, I invite you to go outside today. September is the time to go and see insects. Okay, so we're putting in some links to the, um, that Ken talked about. Oh, we had some more suggestions of not removing predator insects like spiders or praying mantids from your garden. That's another good, another good uh, idea. So um, did anybody else have questions that you wanted to, or other comments that you wanted to say? Great program, thank you. Cam is an awesome job. I love all of her photos and her videos. She is so passionate about insects. It is really fun to see. So any other questions or comments? Do you have any other, any other? You muted. Sorry, I asked if you had any other fun comments. So people are saying that was very cool. I learned a lot, best program ever. Excellent presentation, thanks so much. <laughs> thank you guys. So and thank I, you guys. Have a great day, have a great insect discovery day. And I'm putting in Kim's email address if you have a question that you wanna ask that we didn't get a chance to get to today. So you've got Kim's email in there as well. And then also, um, Sorry, let me share my screen really fast. Just a quick thank you. We do have some other um, programs coming up that you're welcome to sign up for. We've got a virtual Monarch Citizen Science and Exploring Spiders coming up here uh, later on in October. And so again, you can email Kim if you have questions uh, that we didn't answer, kim.bailey at nashville.gov. And you can also email us at wpnc at nashville. Gov as well. And if you enjoyed the program, we would love for you to consider uh, making a donation to our Friends of Warner Parks uh, uh, partner. That would be great. All right, guys. Thank you so much. I don't see any other questions on there. Have a great day. Go outside and enjoy insects, and hopefully we will see you again. Thank you.